Okay. For anyone who just joined us, in the chat, there's instructions for the interpretation feature at the bottom. Tú puedes explicarme de nuevo el proceso que yo lo solo lo entiendo si tú hablas en inglés, pero no estoy escuchando traducción. Ok, mi amor, no hay problema. Vas a ver un globito abajo en su pantalla que dice interpretación. Pero es un globito. Vas a hacerle clic al globito y vas a elegir el idioma. Ok. Ahora voy a hablar en, en inglés para asegurarme que usted escucha y que, bueno, que por lo menos está escuchando la traducción. Ok. Good evening, everyone. I just want to make sure that everyone who is in need of using the interpretation feature is has access and can hear the interpretation in Spanish. Señora Patino, ¿trabajó? Sí. Ok, muy bien. All right, everyone. Well, no, good no trabajó. No. Entonces, yo le di al globito, le, dio, le doy al globito, me dice interpretación, pero se me devuelve al audio original, no se me queda donde yo tengo español. Hmm. Ahí, lo, ahí ya le di en español, ahí está en español, pero cuando ya regreso a la página para verte, se me va para el audio original. Voy a preguntarles a Belén o a Elidian si tienen una alternativa o algo que me pueden sugerir a la señora Patino. I'm sorry, we're just having a, a, access um, with the interpretation. No problem. Señora Patino, ¿estás usando el teléfono, el celular o un computador? Estoy en el celular. Ok. En el celular. ¿Puedo, en el... Tratar, ¿Puedo tratar de irme por la computadora a ver si funciona por ahí? Sí, por favor. Si lo puedes hacer. Ok. She's going to join in from her computer. She's joining in from her cell phone and there might be some difficulties when you're on the cell phone. And I, I think if um, she was to go to the three dots, that says say. four, and mm -hmm. the list will pop up and it will say interpret, interpretation. Okay. Señora Patino, ¿no escuchas? Eh, sí, estoy escuchando. Okay, si vas en su, en su celular, sí. vas a ver tre, tres puntitos a mano derecha. Si le haces clic, ¿sabes? Si oprimas ese, esos tres puntitos. Ajá. Te, sí, da la... ¿Te da la opción para escoger español? Sí, sí, dándole en el globito me da la opción. Mira, yo me, yo me, me da la opción, los cojo en español, yo me regreso para donde ti y en ese momento me dijiste vuélvete a ir allá y él se regresa solo para el audio original. No les okay. y cuando si escoge el globito español, tiene que darle finalizado, finalizado para que acepte el comando y luego entras al de traducción. Oh, okay, Eso es lo que okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Muchas gracias, María. Yeah. Ok, ya le di finalizado. Gracias, gracias María. María. <risa> okay. Bien, sí. sí. We figured it out. ¿Te trabajó ahora, señora Patino? Yo escucho, sí, escucho en español. Okay, sí, muy sí, bien. Perfect. Okay, oh, we're no, good. Okay, 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 you're on. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming in and being here with us. Today we have um, Brian Kipkowitz. He is the Special Education Director here in Connecticut. And we are excited to talk about CT SEDS and information and any updates. Um, so here we are. Um, hi, Brian. Hi. <laughs> good evening. It's great to see you all. I have to first of all thank CPAC and the, the amazing team um, at CPAC for arranging this meeting and inviting me here tonight. And I'm looking forward to, we're a smaller group tonight and I know this is being recorded, but I really wanna make sure I'm learning from you all and answering your questions. But I do have some information to share 
as far as overview and updates, but hope for this evening to be very interactive and answer any questions or comments that, that you might wanna um, share with me. And I hope everybody's warm. I know that it's been freezing lately, so uh, the cold weather's upon us. We had a little spell of warm weather for a bit and now it's back to reality. Very true, Brian. We actually, I know I had snow in my part of Connecticut. I don't know if you Did guys you? had snow. I had snow yesterday, which was really exciting. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> mostly freezing rain. I was driving home late from Hartford yesterday and it was, the roads were very slippery, slick. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So, should I get started? Um, yes. With a little bit of an overview? Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, once again, on behalf of the State Department of Education, I want to thank you for um, being here this evening. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the new IEP and the system that supports the IEP. Um, some of this may be repetitive, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, our state is engaged right now in a huge change process in implementation of a new IEP document, as well as learning a new system. And that's uh, our educators are learning how to use that system. We at the State Department are learning to use a new system. And so um, it's been in an adjustment for sure. And we've been working around the clock to provide training and support. And there have been some challenges related to our launch and implementation of the new system, some of which was expected. So what we knew um, going into this change is that our school districts were using a program for IEPs that was form-based, meaning the system was designed to complete and fill out forms. CT SEDS is a process-based system, which means that there's a flow of information to be entered in. It is not form or document-based. So our educators and um, secretaries, administrative assistants, support personnel all have to learn a new process, unlearn what they're used to, and learn a new process. Because we knew this was a difficult change, we call this year a transition year, meaning students wouldn't um, have the new IEP or the districts aren't required to use the system for students' new IEPs until their annual review or for new students that are just referred this year. So for any new IEPs after July 1, the new templates being used. So districts can choose to use the um, previous IEP form until those two things happen, until one of those two scenarios happen. So for any review revised meeting. So by the end of this school year, every student in Connecticut will have a new IEP. So really next year is our first full year of implementing the system to its full capacity. Um, so it, we had some anticipated challenges, some unanticipated challenges. Like any piece of technology that's large and statewide, especially in this circumstance, there were glitches with the system or things that weren't working as they should as they were designed. Um, so on top of the new learning, there were also some technological and still are today some technological issues with parts of the system. Our vendor um, public consulting group out of Boston has been working furiously to address those and they have fix many of those glitches that weren't working properly. But as I mentioned, there's still some to work through and iron out in the early part of the school year. So it's caused some frustrations, some challenges, and some delays in getting the system up and running as quickly as possible. 
I'm just going to pause there, um, Jovi, to just to see if anybody has any questions or comments on that transition year and the rollout and when to expect to receive a new IEP and maybe if some folks would like to share that they already had their, their child or young adult already has an IEP that is new. All good? All good. Nothing in the chat. I don't see anyone's hands up. Awesome. All right. So moving on, and I know, again, this may be a little bit repetitive, but the, the new IEP was a process that we engaged in even before the pandemic. My first year in the state in this role was um, uh, five years ago. And we held regional forums and received input from parents and educators to improve the IEP. And our goal was to design a document that was less congested, that was a better flow of information. And we're very proud of the result of that IEP. Uh, like any form, it's not perfect and we're not satisfied. We have a goal to continuously improve and receive feedback. Uh, but we feel like it's an improvement from our previous form. One of the biggest changes and differences is that in the prior written notice, which is a requirement um, for districts to provide parent, anytime there's a change or a refusal to change a student's IEP, a student's placement um, to initiate an evaluation, or a determination of eligibility. Any of those four circumstances require that the parent receive notice before that happens. So that used to be in the previous document, page three, and now that's removed and it's a separate document and it was redesigned for school districts to complete. So that's a new format, no new requirements around prior written notice, but it's a new form and it's not included in the IEP. Another major change is the optional summary on the IEP, which was on page two, is now a separate document and it's still optional, but it's not part of the IEP itself. So some teams decide to um, take notes during meetings and document important discussion points that are happening. That is a separate document. And if teams decide to use that, if the school decides to use that, they would share it with the parent after the meeting along with the IEP and along with the prior written notice. So there's additional documents that are being received. They were pulled out. Again, our goal was to streamline the IEP so that only the most important and pertinent information is included in it. The last comment I'll, I'll make, and then I'll again pause for any questions, is that the goals and objectives are structured in a way where the present levels of the student's performance are directly, they're on the, in the same section as the goals and objectives that the team determines based on where the student is. On our old form, it was separated from page four and five all the way to page seven. This document, it's all in the same section. So you can see, how is my son or daughter doing in school? What are their challenges? What are their strengths? What are they doing well? Do we have concerns in that area? If we do, those are going to lead directly to a goal and objective right in that same section of the IEP. So we really feel like that flow of information is much easier to understand and um, more useful for our, our teams. So uh, again, I'll pause there, but I know um, Joviana, this group has heard that, you know, a lot of this information before and has received information on that. I just wanted to kind of put us all in the same space and also wanted to mention that we do have a resource online that is the new IEP manual that articulates each of those sections of the IEP, 
what information should be included in those sections and uh, a variety of resources and definitions. So if you haven't had a chance to review the, I, the new IEP manual, we'll um, a little bit later share that out with you, the direct link and um, go through any sections that you would like to in further depth and detail. We do have a question in the chat. Awesome. Um, and it is Lorena. She is asking, and I, I need to get some background information, but she is asking that, well, she's mentioning her son's IEP is in January. Okay. And will that be, will the new IEP be implemented? So obviously I, I wanna ask you um, if it's an annual, I could put it in the chat if it's an annual um, to get further yeah. information. Yeah, Lorena. that's that's exactly right. Oh, you're gonna ask her. Thank yeah. you. Lorena, me escuchas? Okay. Si es un anual, el enero, en enero, la, la reunión de PPT es un anual, entonces sí se va a implementar un IEP nuevo si es un anual. So I just clarified if it's a if it's an annual, yes, a new IEP will be provided. She would be, you know, the child will transition to the new IEP. Si es una reunión regular, ¿verdad? Para discutir preocupaciones, progreso o unos cambios. Mm -hmm. Si es un anual, okay. So si es un anual, el, su hijo va a, ter, va a ser, tran, lo van a transicionar al nuevo IEP. It is an annual IEP, PPT meeting. That's exciting. So she has that to look forward to in January. <laughs> You'll have to let us know how uh, how the new IEP um, is, if it's easy to read or not. Well, that's a problem. Sí, claro. Okay. Um, mis hijos, yo tengo dos hijos. Y los PPTs fueron ahorita al primer, eh, a principios de octubre. Y yo recibí los nuevos formatos. Eh, pero la escuela en ningún momento me indicó que esto era un proceso nuevo. Yo me he dado cuenta por ustedes. Entonces mi pregunta, ¿hasta dónde eh, la escuela también tiene el compromiso de que nos esté informando y actualizando de todos estos cambios? Give me one second. I'm just writing down. Muy buena la pregunta. Sí, muchas gracias. Miss Patino says she has two children, both on, I on IEP. She recently had PPTs for them in October, and she received the new IEP. But the school never informed her about the about the new IEP. The only way she has known about the process is because of CPAC and the information that we've been able to provide. And her question is, what responsibility does the school have in, in informing parents about this new process and, and new IEP? Yeah, thank you for that question. The, the um, We have made it clear that we are taking every effort to inform parents of the change with the new IEP and holding sessions like this is helpful um, to spread the word. The districts also should be engaged in local efforts to communicate the same with parents. And it sounds like that wasn't the case in, in this circumstance for you. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's, when statewide initiatives occur, occur like this, there's always, you know, a process of transition and a need for really what I would say uh, is increased communication between schools and families. But um, even I would say for even at the PPT meeting table, uh, we've been hearing that the chairs have been having conversations with parents in advance of even starting the meeting letting them know we are working in a new system, 
that there's a new form and a new template and that, um, you know, to try to assist parents in what to expect when they receive the paperwork. Uh, the, the good news is, and, and hopefully this was the case for you, is that any document that is generated in the system is translatable in the top 10 languages in our state. So that is an improvement um, just in the technology in and of itself to be able to share with parents. But as far as the school districts taking on ownership and responsibility, um, we would hope that the schools at the district level and at the school level are taking efforts to share this information with parents also, because um, as much as we appreciate CPAC and rely on their ability to share information through their social media and, and structured meetings and trainings that are being held, it's really going to take every educator's efforts to make sure parents are prepared. If I was a teacher this year and I had a caseload of 20 students, I would recommend that that case manager contact the parents in advance, make sure they have seen the parent resources that we have on the new IEP document, and then answer any questions that they may have. Again, it's new for everyone, but we would still recommend and appreciate additional communications around this change. And um, I'm sorry that didn't happen in, in your circumstance. Oh, I have a question, <clears throat> Brian. Um, the last week, you know, I, uh, I went with two parents. Yep. One in West Heaven and the other one in New Haven. Okay. Both of them, the schools, they were given the same IAP with the same goals for the past years because they didn't change the goals. They claimed that because it was the pandemic and then they didn't make any modifications. Then both of these parents, they have the same IAP. Is that is okay because it looked like it's coming very common right now. Uh, Lena, thank you for the question. Just to clarify, are you saying that they had the same IEP that they did the year before? Not the two separate parents having the same goals and objectives for the different students. They, the year before was the same as the ones that they have now because of the pandemic? Okay. Yeah, that's what the, the school district claimed, that okay. they didn't change the goals because the pandemic. Yeah. So that would be a really major red flag um, for a student not receiving a free appropriate public education. Now, <clears throat> what we guidelines that we sent out during the pandemic, we told teams that we, we know students were, all students were impacted in some way, shape or form because of the closure of the schools back in March, 2020. And then because many schools had hybrid, a combination of in-person and virtual. And then eventually we were all back in person and school districts made great efforts to ensure students with IEPs were in person, but we know that wasn't the case for all students. We also know that students who had to rely on virtual instruction um, overall statewide performed, um, did not perform as well as students that were in school, in person, in the school buildings. And that's based on statewide assessment and us analyzing the difference between their performance on reading and math and science statewide assessments. So during the, during the pandemic, we advised teams to convene PPTs to update present levels of performance in the document. So how a student's performing must be updated at least annually. And we said during the pandemic, 
that's a foundation to start with. So start with the present levels of performance, which then drive the goals and objectives. So anytime we see an IEP that is not changing a goal or an objective from year to year, especially if it's all of the same information, that's an indication that the student did not receive um, special education or a free appropriate public education. Now, I can't make that determination just not knowing or seeing that information, but that would be a a huge red flag. And um, you mentioned it was in two separate instances and two separate parents. So that, that would be a concern certainly that we would wanna investigate further and be involved with and in helping support those parents and the student moving forward. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. I am just gonna put in the chat, Brian, is the, the training modules for the IEP in Spanish, the, the modules, I'm just gonna put it in the chat on the link for everyone as a, Thank you. As a resource. That's awesome. Um, Brian, can you talk about the, the parent portal? I know that's something that has come up quite frequently um, in, yes. in our conversations with parents. Absolutely, yeah. So. I had an opportunity to hold a session with the um, the uh, with a parent and board attorneys recently on the topic of IEP, and there were several questions about the parent portal as well, and some misinformation or uh, myths about what it could do or what it couldn't do, and so. I, I appreciate this question now, and I'm happy to provide clarification on it. The question that was proposed earlier in that session that I held was, why do parents see you know, different information in the system than the school district would see in the module section of the system? And so the reason is, is that a, the parent portal is a communication vehicle, if you will. It's a mechanism that the districts can use and parents can use to share documents back and forth that are required as part of the process. And so even though it's in the same system, it's a it's a separate it's a separate component of that system. The system is designed to send documents automatically to the parent portal when they are finalized. So Joviana, if, if it would be helpful, I can share the document that lists all of the documents that push automatically when they're finalized versus you know, documents that need to be sent. Mm -hmm. So the... Um, we get a lot of questions that ask, well, what if a parent doesn't have the technology necessary to receive those documents? That's okay. In the system, there are three different ways to receive information and documents. One is through the parent portal, which would require the parent to have an email address and a cell phone because there's a verification that you are actually, the parent is receiving the accurate information about your student. So there's a verification that happens through email and then again through your phone or a, sub, a second email with a passcode to enter into the system. Once you're in the system, you would see documents that had been sent. Some of those documents may require action from the parents, meaning you may have to sign consent for an evaluation. So there may be an action for you to sign, give consent or deny consent for that. There may be a document where you have to sign for the initial provision of services when a student first becomes eligible. Again, you would have the opportunity to sign or decline consent for that within the system. The second option would be for the district to 
print the document as a PDF and mail it to you through um, regular email, sorry, the regular mail system. Or if they have a secure way to send that to you via email, they can choose to do that as well. So there's a variety of ways for parents to receive the information. But the parent portal was designed for a convenient way to instantly share documents through the system. Um, we do have a one page, actually it's not one page, it's a quick guide. It's uh, actually three pages, but it's, it's uh, a step-by-step -step process of what to expect when there is a document in the portal for a parent to review. And we do have that in Spanish. At the bottom of that quick guide, there's a brief three minute video that shows you what the system uh, looks like from a parent perspective. And so those are that's a, a resource that we have that's accessible in our, on our website and in our system. The parent portal is not designed to request records. That's a question that we get a lot, that if a parent um, contacts the school and, and requests a Freedom of Information Act and says, I would like one copy of all of my students' records, it likely wouldn't come through the portal because, again, the system's just brand new and um, a student may have documents in CT SEDS that are part of an electronic file, but they may also have hard copies of records in the school system. So when you do request a full set of records, the parent portal wasn't designed to be able to submit those records to you within the portal. It could, but it wasn't designed that way. So. Um, we do get that question quite a bit as well. The parent portal messages that are received, again, are in the native language of the parent in those top 10 languages in the state as well. So we're hoping that that will assist in, it's like anything else when it's new, it's uh, a little bit challenging to get used to it, um, but it's a fairly simple, straightforward process to be able to access the system. I'm interested to hear if any of you have had experience with the parent portal as of yet, or have any questions about it that I can help and answer. I got it for my 504, but not for uh, my son's IEP. Okay. And it was very easy to access. Um, it okay. only took a few seconds to get the code. Yep. I accidentally signed out and I just, requested another one and it instantly came and I was able to get back in. Awesome. I just put on the parent portal link in Spanish um, guide on the website. Oh, I'm sorry. Jen, you're too fast. That whole time I was looking for it. <laughs> Jovi, Maria tiene su mano alzada. Maria. Wow. Hola, good. buenas noches, Brian. Mi nombre Hola. es María Ramos, para los que no me conocen. Vivo en la ciudad de Bridgeport y creo que he sido una de las pequeñas hormiguitas ambasadoras de, ¿verdad? de todo este proceso de transición en el nuevo IEP. Y gracias por la oportunidad que me dio Brian de participar en esos grupos de, de estos cambios. So, mi pregunta sí, eh, todos los miércoles en este grupo fabuloso que nosotros tenemos de apoyo en español, eh, discutimos muchos desafíos con los padres y tratamos ¿verdad? de siempre apoyarlo en la mejor medida posible con la eh, mejor información. Pero mi pregunta es para Brian, ¿cuáles han sido los desafíos, los desafíos para eh, los maestros? Eh, ¿Cuáles son los reportes más comunes? O si pudieras mencionar los primeros tres eh, desafíos que han tenido los maestros, los case managers o los maestros que brindan el servicio de educación especial con este nuevo portal, porque nosotros los padres vamos a tener desafíos individuales, pero eh, la medida en que puedas decirnos, ¿verdad? Y no sea información privilegiada, <risa> ¿cuál han sido los...? Porque queremos trabajar en equipo con los profesores. So, los primeros tres challenges o desafíos que han tenido 
los profesores con esta nueva transición? Joby, ¿quieres eh, traducir o...? I'm sorry, I, I'm hearing... I heard it in English. Oh, you did? Okay. Yes. Brian, did you hear it in English? I did not. I did oh, understand quite a language. bit of it, but not all of it. Okay, you I have to have, pick... Uh, yeah, on the, little, on the little globe, you have to pick English or else you won't hear it. But... My mistake. Um, I was researching something else in the meantime, so I'm going to give you a, um, Lady Ann, uh, uh, ¿tú eras la que estabas traduciendo esa parte? Ok, lo puedes decir de nuevo, sé que ella dijo mucho, pero por lo menos la, la pregunta de ella. Can you hear her in yes. English? Ok. ¿Le preguntas a la traductora o le preguntas, me preguntas a mí? With the parent portal. Okay, sencillo. Ryan, you ready? Yes. Sencillo y la pregunta va summary, porque ahorita me extendí. Ahora voy summary. ¿Cuál han sido los tres desafíos okay. que usted ha recibido de los distritos en cuanto a los case managers o los maestros que brindan educación especial a nuestros niños? Eh, los challenges que han tenido todos profesionales con la nueva transición a este sistema. Los padres vamos a seguir teniendo question. challenge, pero nos gustaría to... trabajar en equipo, you know? Yes. One of the, one thing that comes to mind is the amount of time that it takes to do an IEP in the new system versus the old system. It's taking our teachers longer to do that. That's the feedback we've received. Part of the reason for that is learning a new system. So we expect that your second IEP and third, fourth, fifth, the more familiar you get with the system, the shorter amount of time it should take. Another contributing factor, unfortunately, were the glitches and the bugs in the system that I mentioned, which were causing issues where information would be entered and then have to be re-entered and re-entered. So that was causing a lot of frustrations and it was also uh, resulting in a much longer time to take the teachers and the providers to enter information. And so that I would say that has been a, a big challenge. Um, the second piece, the second challenge is that because this is process-based system and the PPT process isn't always linear, what I mean by that is um, you go into a meeting sometimes with a plan and, and informing the parents about why you're meeting. And then at the meeting, sometimes there are recommendations that are made that weren't planned for. And the example is, let's say the PPT was scheduled as an annual review. And during the meeting, the team decided they wanted to do an evaluation to learn more about the student. But it wasn't on the planning and placement team meeting notice. Because of the way we built the process, the PPT notice reason drives the system and the logic in the system. So from the IEP module, you cannot plan an evaluation. You'd have to go back and ask the parent to waive their five-day notice and check off on that PPT notice that you're planning an evaluation for the student. That will then lead to a permission to do that evaluation assigned consent. So the IEP was the first challenge that came to mind that we've heard feedback on that it takes longer. 
The second ch challenge is being able to navigate these processes that sometimes aren't planned for, but parents still require notice. The reason why we put that logic in is because a parent needs to have advance notice and information about what is being proposed at that meeting. They could agree on that day to do something different, but it's going to require some additional steps for the district that they wouldn't necessarily have to do in the old system. So I would say that would be number two. <clears throat> And number three, the biggest challenge um, would be from a, from a user perspective only, we have so many user guides and so many resources. And this is true for many of us too as parents and teachers don't know where to look. Um, the answer's there, but there's just resource and user guide overload. So it takes time to try to find answers out and we wanna reduce that time for our educators. So in the system, we're designing a searchable resource database. So if I am looking for the process on a manifestation determination PPT meeting, as a user, I wanna type in manifestation and have the resources appear and click in the system and be able to find the information I need so I can do the process that I, that I need to um, have happen. So that's the third area, um, Maria, where I would say has been the biggest challenge. It's getting the information in the hands of the people that need it quickly so they're not losing time searching for it. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, thank you. It's hard to rank, but I would say that those would be my answers. Um, but there, you know, there have been other challenges and other frustrations, but I appreciate Maria, you saying the partnership and collaborating and working together to move through this change process. Other states have gone through a similar process to us in an, using a new system. And PCG has supported eight other states in a statewide launch like this. When we talked to other states, they said it really takes a full year for people to feel comfortable and understand um, the system. So we expect at the start of next school year, people to be in a very different place and the system to be working um, and not working, the system to be um, enhanced in certain areas based on the feedback. So um, that's, that's something that just our colleagues have told us about the first year of implementation is very challenging even if you're not changing the IEP, but when you're also changing the IEP, it's, it's, a, it's a significant adjustment for, uh, for folks. Brian, Brian um, I'm sorry. sorry. I have a yeah. question. Uh, Brian, um, do you think that would be possible that the Department of Education is stop talking all these um, abbreviations on the PPT meetings because it's always so confusing for the parents and they don't understand what they are talking. Yeah, I feel like we should have a jar and put a quarter in every time we use an acronym that we're not, um, that Absolutely. is not understood. Yeah, we would probably be very wealthy at the end of that meeting. <laughs> That's a great suggestion. And if, if you have ideas on how we can help with this, and I think as educators, we're all, we all fall into that, that um, pattern in the language that we use. And I think it's, if we could, if we could um, unlearn some of those acronyms, like, like you were mentioning, and be able to communicate differently than understanding and communication would increase. 
So be, I think be, one of the reasons in special education that it happens is because it's based in legal requirements by the federal government, by the state government. And so it kind of naturally lends itself to that, those abbreviations and the use of the language. But we do have to do a better job of, you know, not of using terms that are more universal or easier understood. I was reading a research document the other day that was actually a visual graphic novel and it was special education based and I had never seen anything like it and it intrigued me and I was wondering if we could do something similar for example for our procedural safeguards even if it was just a supplemental document mm -hmm. to try to bring visuals and simplify all of that legal language in a way that educators and parents could could understand so that might be a project for us this year and and in the uh, in the future that would be a really good idea to bring parents in right having a discussion here yeah but you know how that would help support them in understanding the processes i know i've seen some um as a matter of fact we had a there was a discipline training that we had last week and it it, it sort of gave the visual of if the child gets in trouble, the suspension, meeting, and like, you know, just gave arrows of what yeah, the next like steps an infographic. are. Yes, yeah, and then the other way. So it was just really good for the parent to see that visual. I feel like we're not doing our job if we just have these dense, you know, thick documents. That, and it's similar with a user guide. We really tried not to put user guides out for educators that were table of contents was two pages long and that they're 70, 80 pages long because it's just too much to, to digest. And, and so and I, I think about this too with our general monitoring and supervision responsibilities, which means that we're, um, we have mechanisms in place to hold the state and our schools accountable for our student, for the special education laws and regulations. And if we're not able to communicate that in a way that's understood by the educators and the parents, again, we're not doing our job, or, you know, um, so we would be very interested in working with CPAC and many of you to see how we could, you know, communicate differently. We were just talking about the prior written notice earlier today and how confusing that document is and the way the law is written, how confusing it is, and the variability because of that in how different schools complete that form. And if we could take a different approach, perhaps we could make some progress in that area so that it's, it's a, a more understood aspect of the process. Agreed. Lucy, your hand is up. Yes, well, um, as a former foster mom, yeah, as, as a grandma, things, I've had a lot of questions and a lot of confusion. Um, even doing my homework, I just don't seem to learn. So I would find ways, um, let's say, go to sleep early, get up four in the morning when my mind is very clear and do my homework because it's so, it's so much information and we, we can't do everything in one day, but experience like locked, like, I don't know what to do. One day I called, I have a little girl jumping right next to me, my granddaughter, excuse her. One day I called the children's law line. It was amazing. It was amazing how they helped me. They were so patient. She follows me everywhere I go. Grandma, could say. it was amazing how they helped me so much. I was telling them about the abbreviations and the letters and the emails that I was receiving and I was really locked. I, I was blocked. I didn't know what to do. And uh, they really helped me a lot. 
So I think um, um, a lot of people in Connecticut can look into it because they are very good people. It's called uh, the Children's Law Line. They're very good and they help a lot. Well, as always, I learn from you all every time we meet. So that's a new resource for me that, that I will definitely look into and try to find out more information about. Do you know if that's a Connecticut based or a, is it more a regional based support? Do you know? Uh, no, I think it's Connecticut. It's a Connecticut yeah, based entity. Yeah, the children's law line. Yes. Okay. Um, they sent out people who immediately called me, text me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They sent me emails, and they kept going and going. They, they didn't give up until I was ready to understand and to continue to, what was my goal. And it, without them, I was locked. I was completely blocked. I, I, I had a very big problem in my shoulder because being a, foster, a former foster mom is different than going through it. Than mm -hmm. having a child of your own. In my case, my niece, my brother incarcerated, the mother incarcerated, and mm -hmm. then the niece ends up in our care. And we don't know what to do. You're so overwhelmed you don't know where to begin mm -hmm. and then when you start the, the the questions that you have are not being answered and you and you it's really 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 hard i dedicated many many hours i said i would do what would get up at 4 a.m every day i did that for more than a year and uh but when i was blocked the children's law line they helped me so much and they were so polite and he, some of them were like, like students, but still, you know, and he was, they were like, if I can't um, answer, call this extension and speak to this person. So they were like giving you second options. So it was really great. They helped me when I was blocked. They opened the doors for me, for real, they did. That's wonderful. I'm actually, I have their website open now and taking a look at it. So I'll definitely bookmark this. I, it looks like a, a, like you said, Children's Law Center uh, uh, a pr protection agency. And yeah. Um, yeah. Children's Law Line. So yeah. yeah. I put the resource in the, the, the chat. So the link and the phone number is there on the chat. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Brian, with, you're with you're an early riser. Is that why you're an early riser? Your granddaughter gets you up at four thirty in the morning. No, they took advantage no, that I came to visit. And everybody was shopping and left me with five children. Oh wow! <laughs> and I can't say no. <laughs> well, you're sharp at four thirty in the morning, huh? <laughs> four in the morning. That's when my mind is clear. Okay. I'm ready. I'm ready with prayer. And, yeah. and, I, and I keep going, I keep going. And it, during the day, if I can't take it, I'll do a nap. It's normal to do a nap. Uh, the child is in school or whatever. Naps are great. And then keep going. Naps are this very is the smallest one of 11 yeah. grandchildren. What? Oh. I hope no more. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow, thank you for your crazy. work and your foster work. And um, <laughs> Looks like you have, and sounds like you have a beautiful family. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that resource. Brian, thank you. Uh, Brian, I have a question. Yes. I think sure. you remember that we'll be talking a lot about the procedures on manual. Uh, yes. And, um, okay. Then I read it all. <laughs> You did? Okay. The, 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 IEP, the IEP manual or the procedural safeguards? Procedural safeguards. Okay. Then I am in the page 23. That is about the transition to special education services from birth to three. Educational transition for idea 2004, part C. To idea 2004, part B. Then at the next page, that is the 24, it say, the district coordinator with explain the PPT process 
and provide the parents with the pre-PPT documents and information that they need to participate fully in the process. Then this is supposed to be part of the idea. Then how they are going to be fully the process is again, the documents they are not tra translated in their own language. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to understand your question, Lena. So you're so you're looking at the procedural safeguards document. Yes. Um, and, yeah, and you're and looking and particularly at the part C to part B transition. So children that are moving from birth to three into the public school setting. Three. Yes, and 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 yeah. that's supposed to be covered from idea. That is, yeah, the. Um, you know? Individuals yeah. with Disabilities Education Improvement Act, Part yes. C, yes. is then... is all about birth to three services, and Part yeah. B is this is what we oversee for students once they're in public schools from pre K, age three, yeah. and for in some students all the way through either graduation or exit or reaching yeah. the maximum age. Then, and you're asking yeah, then, about translation translation of documents that are part yeah, of because, that process of evaluation. Yeah, because over, yeah, because and 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 they have some some numbers there, you know, like one, two, three, three, four, five. Then number five say the district coordinator will explain the PPT process and provide the parents with the pre. PPT documents and information that they need to participate in a fully participate fully in the process. And then this against what we'll be discussing the idea doesn't know cover or, or doesn't know support the translation of the documents. That's my point. Because yeah. I read it all. I, I, I say it has to be is in some part that that the parents has to be able to understand. That's right. And here is is it say that they are, they are provided the parents everything that they need to be fully in the process. Yes, a meaningful like participate in the process yes. and We're understand. Process and, yes. mm -hmm. Yeah, fully and be a contributing member. Absolutely. What it what it and I can send you a letter from OSEP as well, which talks about this, in that the IDEA does not require the districts to translate every document or all of the documents that are related to special education as part of the process. However, they are responsible, the school district to ensure the parents understand and are informed about the IEP. Now, the prior written notice um, is a little bit different in that, in, in any time a parent's providing consent. And I'm trying to look at the page too so that I can reference because I, I believe we have a link to that OSIP is, and I'm using acronyms again, so I apologize, the Office of Special Education Programs in Washington, D.C., our federal oversight authority with special education, has a document around translation services, but also there are Title I requirements for translation that are different than the ones in the IDA. So it's a matter of combining those two laws to ensure that parents understand and are meaningful participants in that process. So your question is, how can you be meaningfully involved and not have a document in your native language? It would Someone would have to orally explain to you in your native language the content of that document in the meaning. So yeah, that yeah. yeah, the problem is that you know the uh, to explain page by page right. in a PPT meeting. Also. Yeah. Understood. 
So that's the exciting part about CT SEDS is that those documents will be translated and are translatable. That's the good news, but there's still, it doesn't resolve all of the translation issues because as we mentioned before, if a school psychologist did an evaluation and needs to share that with the parent, the system CT SEDS won't translate that document because it was generated outside of the system. So how is the parent going to be able to access the information in that report if it's not translated? That's, that's another important question. And I know Joviana and, and uh, Keo and others have been involved, um, Jen as well, with working with a variety of stakeholders to improve not only translation of documents, but also translators during the PPT meetings um, to ensure that parents are meaningful participants. And we have a lot of work to do in that area across the state. Uh, Brian, one comment that I'm receiving um, as to the importance why this document should be written in their native language is because they can refer back to data um, from mm -hmm. evaluation reports, from progress reports. They can mm -hmm. revise it, analyze it, and contribute and prepare for the meeting. So mm -hmm. someone just share that with me, and I wanted to mention that to you. Thank you. Yo tengo una pregunta. Mi pregunta, yo soy del distrito de Stanford. Eh, mi pregunta no es de forma, sino de contenido. Y nosotros estamos detectando que en este momento tenemos un problema grande de contenido de la información de la IP, porque consideramos que no se está condensando en la información nuestras opiniones o lo que nosotros observamos en el proceso de nuestros hijos. Entonces vemos que hay una inconsistencia súper grande en cuanto a lo que el distrito escribe con relación a lo que es el diagnóstico y evolución de nuestros hijos. Tenemos, tenemos esa dificultad grande Y el problema es que no se nos escucha, no se nos tiene en cuenta. Nosotros somos invisibles, nosotros somos totalmente ignorados. Y los procesos que se están dando son procesos que están totalmente salidos de las leyes. La, hay una violación a las leyes estatales, federales, a derechos humanos, a, a la Constitución. Y en este momento nosotros no tenemos quien nos escuche. Entonces, uh, en lo personal, yo he pasado por un proceso bien grande con mi hijo y en este momento, y, y por proceso de evaluaciones. Y el distrito tiene muchas estrategias y dentro de las estrategias que tiene es extender el tiempo hasta un punto donde ya sea la hora de salida de nuestros hijos y ya no hay nada que hacer y todo el tiempo se perdió y totalmente ignorados entonces desde esa desde el contenido de esa información cómo podemos porque estamos nos sentimos totalmente desamparados nosotros no tenemos nadie que nos represente ni que venga a, a abogar por nosotros entonces cómo manejar esa esa parte Thank you for sharing that uh, with us. And I wanna, uh, I wanna acknowledge that anyone who feels unheard and unlistened to is, is just a, a horrible place to be in. And I, I can't imagine going through a process with um, you know, a son or daughter and feeling like you're either unheard or not listened to or that, I can't imagine that's anyone's intent in education and that is your experience in your circumstance. So that's a very challenging place to be in and um, one that needs to be addressed. Um, so I have a couple of questions about what you shared, but overall I would say that 
you know, parents have rights and students have rights within these processes. So one of the things that was mentioned was an evaluation extension. There are legal, um, there are legal processes and avenues to an ex to extend an evaluation timeline. I'm not sure if that's what you were referring to, but as an example, if an evaluation in our state is being conducted from the day the referral is made initially by either the parent or the school to the time the IEP is implemented is a 45 school day timeline. That can be extended beyond 45 school days in a few different circumstances. One is if the team is considering a specific learning disability for that child, the parent and the school can agree to extend that 45 school day timeline and choose a date in the future that is reasonable and agreeable. The second circumstance is Sometimes after the 45 days, there isn't enough information to make a determination, and the parent and the PPT can agree to extend the evaluation timeline by implementing what's called a diagnostic placement, a trial placement for diagnostic purposes. And that's an additional 40 day timeline where the team's asking questions and gathering data to be able to make a determination. In those circumstances, the team needs to meet every 10 days and have an eligibility determination at the 40th day. So that's another potential extension of that timeline. And the third um, possible extension is that the student who was initially identified and referred, their placement upon eligibility is in an out of district placement, meaning that student's needs were so significant that the school couldn't meet the student's needs and they required a placement in a therapeutic out of district program, that would be a, a, an additional 15 days for that IEP to begin. Now, I hope I didn't take all that time if that wasn't your issue, but I, do, I did hear that there was an extension in the timeline for the evaluation that you were going through with, with your son. As far as support, um, there are many options for support when there are questions or when people don't feel heard. And I'm sure you've taken many of these steps already because you're on our call with us here tonight. But, you know, strategies in working with your case manager, working with the building administrator, working with the special education director, and in some circumstances, even the superintendent in the school district. Um, you always have the resource through CPAC and um, th that, that they can call and provide advice and ask specific questions and try to gather additional information. You can also call us at the Bureau of Special Education. Um, we're just about ready to launch a new Bureau of Special Education call center that we're very excited about. But in the, um, you can also reach us at the Bureau, and we are able to assist in, on your behalf either informally or formally if you believe that those rights that you have are not being um, heard or the district is not implementing special education services or the process the way that it needs to be. So we have consultants that are able to assist um, if needed.
Sí, muchas gracias. Eh, yo pienso que la explicación que me dio es muy buena, pero realmente no aplica a lo que yo he vivido, a lo que hemos pasado. Entonces sí okay. es conveniente tener un, una línea de apoyo para poder manifestar todo el caso. Ok. Yeah, our number at the bureau is, I can put it in the chat where you can call and speak to one of our consultants who we can provide some individual assistance for you. So I'll go ahead and put our line. And while Brian does that, I do want to say that we also offer one-on-one um, -on -one consultation services for families. And I put our um, website in Spanish with resources as well as our phone number. So for individual cases, feel free to reach out to us. Awesome. Brian, I did want to ask if you could share something. I know we only have about 10 minutes, nine minutes. I just wanted to see if you could share. I know that Maria Ramos had asked the question, like what, what are the common um, yeah. issues that are happening? But can you share a positive note? Like what are the things that districts are seeing that are, is beneficial? That is like the translation feature, right? That is a, a really big um, change that they don't have to do that piece. Or can you share any more information about what is positive? What has the district been seeing in regards to the new IEP and the CT sets process? Yeah, thank you for that. To balance out the challenges, it's always great to talk about the positive. We've heard a lot of feedback that the new IEP template is great. Like the teachers really like it. We've heard some positive feedback from parents as well, that it's easier to, to read, it's easier to, you know, to utilize. And so that, that has been a positive. Also, despite the frustrations of what I've talked about, the glitches and the technology bugs, so many people have, in the midst of their communication of frustration, have also said they really see the potential of the system and see how kind of the light at the end of the tunnel once those glitches are ironed out and working as designed, they really see the potential. There's <clears throat> all of the districts utilizing the same system and the same structure really provides a lot of benefits for students that transition from one district to another district in sharing of, of that information and records. Our statewide student information system is updating on a nightly basis. So in real time, we're able to have a better understanding of where students are and when they transition, even students coming from out of state. So that's a secondary benefit. The, the form itself, the output of the system has been a, a benefit. And then also everyone using the same system is a tremendous benefit. Our school districts used to spend a lot of time and resources in reporting data to us. That will be obsolete. We now have the data that we need in the system. The districts no longer have to send it to us. So that's a third real positive aspect of the system and the reports that it can generate for us at the state level and reports that we send to the federal government as well. And then the last thing I would say is what we've heard is that the process-based system requires more collaboration. When you're completing and filling out a form, a, it lends itself to someone doing this, like you complete this form, you complete that part of it. The process-based system really requires greater coordination and collaboration and communication between a variety of team members. And that's some of the feedback that we've received as well. It doesn't mean it's easy <laughs> or easier. It's very hard, but the process is resulting in higher quality content and you know, the, the more members of the team being involved in the design of the IEP. That's an ultimate goal 
And again, some things that we've heard preliminarily about benefit of the system. Thank you, Brian. And um, I think Mabel has her uh, hand up. Mabel, do okay. you want to unmute? Sí, gracias. Sí. Hola, Brian. Este, yo tengo una pregunta que, que hacerte, que quedé en duda cuando una de las compañeras le preguntó. O sea, mi pregunta es directa. Usted no tiene ningún interés en poder que los padres latinos o de cualquier otra cultura tengan las evaluaciones o documentos importantes traducidos en ayudarnos con eso. Yeah, that's absolutely. So we, the, and I'll just reiterate this again, but this, that any document that's part of the special education process or the Section 504 process will be translated completely, not just the template, but also the content. The evaluations, we still need to do work with our school districts to be able to provide that to the parents, again, so that they can be meaningfully part, part, meaningful participants in the process. And the point that was made earlier also about referring back to that data and information when they need to, when, when the plans are being designed. So absolutely, you mentioned the, um, the Latino community and um, we have, we're fortunate to live in a state that is uh, diverse and have, we have many um, community members that have as their, their primary language other than English. So we're, we're definitely willing and open to um, strategies to be able to provide assistance to ensure that, that, um, that parents are meaningfully participants um, in the process. Yo entiendo que aquí todos en el grupo estamos ansiosos de que por favor usted tome acción sobre este asunto que se le ha discutido muchas veces. Nos urge que por favor se nos traduzcan documentos importantes más allá del IP para sentirnos incluidos y parte del proceso para poder uh -huh. abogar de manera correcta por nuestro hijo. Y usted está allá arriba, usted nos puede ayudar. Thank you. Have, um... Have you had experience receiving translated evaluations or when you request the evaluations be translated, what are your experiences now? En mi caso, yo sí la he tenido traducida después de haber hecho ciertos procedimientos, pero estoy abogando en nombre de otros padres que no han tenido esta oportunidad. Y que no sea necesario llegar a los procedimientos que tal vez yo tuve que llegar. No, no queremos tener que llegar a ningún otro procedimiento que sea este. Hablar diplomáticamente, con respeto, que usted se ponga en nuestro lugar, que sea empático y diga a los distritos, ok, vamos por más, vamos a hacer más, vamos a incluir a estos padres que quieran realmente ser parte de la educación de sus hijos. Quieren entender. I understand. Thank you for sharing that. De nada. Gracias, Mabel. Thank you, Mabel, for um, sharing. We are working on that. As Brian said, Jen, Adriana, and Kio and I are part of a, a, a group of stakeholders who are trying to make um, things available to families um, who are non-English speakers. It's a process, right? Mm -hmm. And But we are working on it. And thank you, Mabel, for sharing, because we do know that our families need to be able to be um, informed so that they can participate and make informed yeah. decisions and feedback and provide information. So thank you. Well, we, we, have have to, we have work to do. Yes, yes. <laughs> if you, if anyone has any questions or comments that they want to share later on, I'm going to put my, you know, if you miss something or think of something later, I am putting my um, email. 
in the chat. So if you have questions that you forgot to ask Brian or didn't think of it at the moment, you can definitely um, email me and then I can, we can forward it to, to Brian and get those questions asked for you. But we are continuing to work on the new IEP, provide updates as we get them um, so that everyone has the up, most up-to-date information. Thank you, Brian, for being here today. Thank you so much. I appreciate the questions and the comments and the um, opportunity to spend some time with you. And I uh, wish you all um, a happy Thanksgiving for those of you that celebrate in um, the holidays coming up as well, in case I don't see you before then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank much you. for your time, Brian. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, Brian, everyone. Thanks. for speaking Bye. directly with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, interpreters. Thank you. You want to stop the recording? Yes. If I can find the recorder, stop over oh, right here. Done.